In all these areas, keep in mind that we'll constantly be reusing the same basic principles that we just talked about. That it only makes sense to think of an equilibrium existing with a large number of people, and that there's this intimate relationship between, uh, between comparative statics and uh, you know, the basic principles of stability and optimization. And finally, that you know, income effects can, can be ignored. Okay. So let's talk about international trade. Maria, can you, um, can you tell us what are some of the fundamental uh, benefits that come from the existence of trade between people or countries or whatever? Yeah. Comparative advantage, yeah. Yeah. Consumers will benefit from lower prices. Yeah. And, um, well, I think that's maybe. Yeah, well, um, and but just think more broadly. Imagine that Daniel has an apple and you have an orange. And Daniel likes oranges and you like apples. What's the benefit of you two trading? Yeah, so basically what leads to the benefits of trade is that different people are different. And we can take advantage of that to gain benefits in all sorts of ways. So the thing is, I said, Daniel likes oranges, or you like apples, but you have the reversed things. Trading allows you to account for the fact that you're different. If you were exactly the same, if you liked exactly the same things, and you had all the exactly the same things, there would be no benefit to you of trading. Right? So trading all comes from individuals or countries differing in some way or another. Right? It could be that they differ in what they have. It could be that they differ in what they like. It could be that they differ in what they're able to create. But all of it comes from exploiting the fact that people are different in various ways. Right? So all gains from trade come from some form of heterogeneity, effectively. Okay. Now different models focus on different sources of heterogeneity. So the most basic international trade model is called the heckscher olin trade model. And Nancy, can, can you explain uh, in the heckscher olin trade model what the sources of the gains from trade are? Do you, do you remember the heckscher olin model? Yeah, it's like, you know, maybe Latin America has a lot of uh, gold and maybe Europe had a lot of cloth and one can give the other cloth and the other can give the other gold, right? So um, that's exactly like the story with Maria and Danielle having the oranges and the apples, right? So different countries have different demands and different goods. And international trade is just about rearranging the goods so that they go to the people who most like those goods, right? Um, trade allows a better match between goods and demand. So I think probably the leading example of that, not in terms of international trade, but in terms of you know, our everyday life, is insurance. So like, you know, imagine you have a big risk that your house is going to burn down, and an insurance company doesn't have any risk associated with that. They can sell you insurance, and they can take on some of the risk, you can get rid of some of the risk, and everyone can be made better off. We got rid of the fact that you had this very concentrated risk, we spread it out more evenly, and we got a better uh, allocation, right? So that's, that's one very basic form of trade. That's sort of called pure trade in some sense, right? It's just, we're just reallocating things. Another uh, very important model is about specialization. And this was first proposed by Adam Smith and then was formalized very, actually pretty recently by Paul Krugman and, and similarly sort of by M Mark Mellitz. So Sergio, could you say what's the basic idea of gains from trade in that model? Well, so that's actually more Ricardo's model. Do you remember, do you ever read The Wealth of Nations? Wealth of Nations opens up with a very famous scene about a pin factory. 
And what happens in the pin factory? What is the source of gains from trade in the pin factory? What? Mm, do, do you want to follow up on that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that, here's the really interesting thing. I said all trade comes from heterogeneity. But in Smith's pin factory, there's just a bunch of workers. They're all basically the same. But what happens? They can each choose to become different. They can each specialize in one thing. And because it takes time to switch between different, doing different things, because it takes time to learn to be good at doing one thing, by specializing, we endogenously all become different. We take advantage of the economies of scale of doing a particular activity. And through that division of labor, we all become better off. So that's the Smith, Krugman, Mellitz model. People are ex ante the same, but they specialize in doing one thing. And there's economies of scale because it's costly to change between different activities or costly to get good at doing one activity. And uh, therefore, um, it, it's, it makes a lot more sense for everyone to do one thing. Now the final model, which is called the Ricardian model, was what uh, Sergio was getting at. But Juan, would you mind just explaining what the Ricardian model of trade highlights? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So every country should take the thing that they have the best technology at producing and should just do that thing and let other countries do other things. So some countries are better at producing some things. Trade allows for comparative advantage. Now, each of these models tells us interesting things, and I want to go through some of the applica applications of each of these types of models. Okay. So probably the most interesting application of the Heckscher-Ohlin model of international trade is what's called the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. So this says that, um, let, let's take an example of this. So imagine that US and China have the same demand, but that the US has a lot of, is very good at making uh, agricultural products, and Chinese are really good at making computers or manufactured goods. So um, in the US, farm goods are going to be cheap compared to manufactured goods if there's no trade between the US and China. Whereas in China, farm goods will be expensive uh, and the uh, computers or manufactured goods will be cheap. Right? Now, um, if we start trading between the two countries, the prices are going to end up somewhere in between. right? because they won't be as high uh, for man, uh, manufactured goods as they were in the US. They won't be as high for agricultural goods as they were in China. And what that means is that despite the fact that we know that there's going to be gains from trade overall, the manufacturers in the United States are going to get hurt. And the farmers in China are going to get hurt. Right? So whoever it was that was producing the thing that was scarce is going to be hurt by trade. Whoever was producing the thing that was abundant will be benefited. Now, the people who get benefited are benefited more than the people who get hurt are hurt. But still, this is a basic insight that comes out of the Heckscher-Ohlin model and, and is called the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. Whoever has the scarce thing in the country relative to the country that you trade with is going to be hurt by the introduction of trade. Um, and this is called the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. It's used, uh, economists advocate solving this problem by when we have trade redistributing from the abundant factor to the scarce factor to make sure that you know, the manufacturers in the US aren't hurt too much, that the farmers in China aren't hurt too much, so that everyone is better off. Um, but the problem with doing that is that if we get into the business of every time we start having trade with someone else, compensating the people who lose, people could then strategically try to set up trade barriers that protect their business just so that when we do have international trade, they'll get compensated for that change, right? 
And so it can become very inefficient to um, compensate everyone when we have this opening up of trade, right? And that in practice ends up leading people to lobby against the freeing of international trade if they're a relatively scarce factor. Some really interesting uses have been made of this theory. So um, there's this uh, UCLA professor, I, I think his paper is on the syllabus, uh, but, I don't, um, but I don't remember his name, and he argues that the different political patterns that we saw in Europe were at least in large part determined by the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. So he said, think about England. England is a really tiny place, right? Little island with tons of people and tons of machines. I don't think anyone would dispute that it's a very crowded island with lots of machines, right? And so what's the natural alliance that you would get there? You would have labor and capital working together and fighting against land. That's why you had sort of a conservative party and a liberal party in the UK. And why there, the lineup ended up being a fight between sort of the old guard and the forces of progress. On the other hand, think about Germany. Germany uh, uh, is a country where you had um, not so many uh, machines, not so much land, and lots of people. That's what he argues. And so you got an alliance between uh, the owners of the machines, the capitalists, and the landowners against the laborers. And so you ended up with a conflict of fascism versus communism rather than a, a conflict of uh, labor, uh, of uh, like the new progressive people against the old landed aristocracy. So he tries to talk you know, about a lot of the political history of Europe using the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. So that's kind of an interesting economic way to think about these things. And in fact, I think if you go back and think about many political uh, developments in history, like you know, movements for, against colonialism and so forth, you can think about the ways in which they allowed for trade and the natural alignments of interest that those created. Okay, so Adam Smith proposed a different model, this model of the division of labor, right? And um, in that model, people are basically all the same, but there's these economies of scale. You can learn to specialize and, and spend less time uh, switching between things. And the classic example is the pin factory. Now Krugman, Paul Krugman famously applied this idea to trade between different countries. Um, and he drew from this some really interesting conclusions. So one of these conclusions was that it's really good to live in a big country. Why would it be good to live in a big country according to this model? Uh, is Pablo VR here? Pablo, yeah. Exactly, so there's more people around for specialization and there's lower shipping costs to all the people around you, right? And so you can specialize in something very, very, very narrow and get a very high return on that because you can go way down the economies of scale line. So people living in a big place, even if they're no more talented than anyone else, will automatically make more money and live a better life because they'll be able to exploit the uh, gains from specialization more. Second, he predicted that people who um, live in a, uh, people who produce a certain product at home will export that product all over the world. That sounds a little bit counterintuitive in some sense, right? Wouldn't you think that if someone really likes a product, they'd want to import it from all, all over the world? But instead, he predicted that if you like something, that you'll end up exporting it all over the world. Sebastian, why do you think that that's the case? Well, that's because you're good at producing it, but the question is no. I'm just saying you're not any better at producing something. It's just something that people in that country like, and you end up exporting that all over the world. Sebastian, why do you think that that would be the case?
or not an example, but just like what, why by the logic of this specialization stuff, why would, why would you end up exporting rather than importing something that you like? Mm, do you, you want to go ahead? You first have the industry first, like to fight the internal market, and then it gets as efficient as so it can, and then it, it that efficiency is able to compete with other markets. Exactly. It's like if you have an economy of scale in producing something, right? Then if you have a big local market, you'll supply that market. And once you're supplying that market, you might as well export the stuff abroad as well, right? So if there's this endogenous specialization, right, then countries will end up exporting rather than importing things that they like. And think about that. That explains a lot of patterns of trade we see. So, you know, India is exporting people who do Indian food all over the world. It's not importing spicy food. It's ex I mean, that sounds obvious, but of course that's the case, right? And the reason is because there's all these people who specialized in being good at making Indian food. It has nothing to do with the fact that India has the right peppers for Indian food. I mean, those, those grow all over the world. But the thing is that people specialize because they were supplying the Indian market, and then they export that all over the world. Peru exports Peruvian food. It doesn't import Peruvian food, right? J Japan exports all these fish. Even though you know, there's decent waters for fishing in Japan, but that's not really the point. The point is that there's all these people who are good at telling what are the good fish in Japan, and then they ship it all over the world, right? Because they specialize because of the demand in the local market, they then become good at it and can export it all over the world. So that's a really different than, prediction than what you would expect coming from the other trade models that comes out of the logic of the Krugman and the Smith model, right? Um, so like one example of this is imagine that you grow up with a sick grandmother, right? You might end up becoming a nurse. Why? Because you got really good when you were young taking care of your grandmother, and therefore you end up selling the services that you acquired through getting good at taking care of your grandmother to the rest of the market. So something that drives what we end up selling to other people is not just uh, what we're naturally good at, but what uh, we had to become good at because of the demands that exist in our life. So we might end up exporting nursing services rather than hiring a nurse uh, if, if our grandmother was sick. Kind of interesting, right? Um, this has some interesting implications for protectionism. So on the one hand, how could protectionism be helpful? Is Omar Pesco here? Um, well, protectionism could be helpful because it can help you get a, a start in a market. So think about if you're ever trying to acquire a skill, probably one of the first things you do is you stop buying it in the market. So if you want to get good at cooking, probably one of the first things that you do is stop going out to restaurants and start cooking at home, right? Because that helps you get experience with being a good cook. So in some sense, that's a form of protectionism, right? Even though clearly you're less good at making food at this time when you start cooking, you do that in order to gain experience so that eventually you can cook for other people, right? But Mark Mellitz made a, a very interesting point, which is that um, it's the best to specialize in the one thing that you're absolutely the best at. You want a big market, so you can specialize in the one thing that you're the best at to focus very, very narrowly rather than to uh, just get good at lots of things. So it's true, you might want to be protectionist on one very little thing that you might get to be the absolute best in the world at, but you don't want to have broad protectionism. Okay, so final, the final perspective on international trade that I want to talk about is the uh, Eden and Cordum uh, model, which is a formalization of the informal logic of Ricardo. So there, trade arises purely from heterogeneity and efficiency of producing things. Every, the only input is labor. That's all people have is just labor. And everyone has the same demand for goods. But some countries are just randomly better at producing certain things than other countries. Um, and they proposed a very famous model of this. model has a lot of details that I'm not really going to get into, but you can read the paper. It's on the reading list. 
But the basic idea is each country produces a continuum of goods. They're more efficient randomly at producing some goods than at others. Um, and they have, uh, they have an app, some countries may have an absolute advantage. That is, they may in general be more productive at producing things. But there's also a spread in how productive they are. And trade occurs to take advantage of that spread in the productivity. Now, it's costly to transport goods abroad, and that gets in the way of perfectly taking advantage of comparative advantage, right? Um, goods will then tend to flow from markets where they're relatively cheap on average to markets where they're relatively expensive, from the countries with a higher absolute advantage to the other ones, but goods will flow in both directions because of comparative advantage, right? Um, and to show that there's these costs of transporting goods across countries, Edom and Cordum used the following analysis. So they graphed the um, normalized share of imports that a country has, and they graphed that on the distance between countries. So they said, if I take a given country, what share of its imports come from different countries around the world, and how does that depend on how far those countries are away from me? And you see a very strong trend, right? The further a country is away from you, the less likely that you are to import from them. So that's the force that goes against uh, comparative advantage. And by using uh, that force as sort of the cost side, they're able to calibrate how much comparative advantage there must be in order for us to observe the trade flows that we see in the world. Um, and they. And that allows them to calibrate this model and calculate how much reduction in welfare we would get if there was no trade at all. And they found that there would be a 15% reduction in the wealth of the world if we went to complete autarky across countries, which maybe is a surprisingly small number, right? I mean, it's significant, but it's not so huge. Um, one interpretation is that this is because this model is ignoring these economies of scale benefits from trade that we were talking about. Um, they, they, they also argue that there's much more to be gained by making trade perfectly easy across countries than there is to be lost from making trade not exist at all. So that's kind of interesting. One of the things that's really impressive about this model is that by doing this, they can calculate the absolute advantage of countries. So they can say, well, if every, you know, we have this spread of uh, different uh, abilities in producing different goods of countries, but then to account for the fact that you know country might be pretty close to other countries and still not have so much trade, we have to say that some countries just have an absolute disadvantage and are not so competitive, right? And so they were able to back out of that which countries had the biggest absolute disadvantage and which countries were most closed to trade from abroad. And what they found is that on both of those two measures, Greece was the absolute last country out of 50 uh, relatively well-off countries they considered. And in fact, we saw that Greece had this terrible economic collapse. So the thing that was amazing about this model is despite the fact that it made all these simplifying assumptions, it was able to calibrate this model of international trade and actually make quantitative predictions like that Gr Greece was going to be the country in the worst shape, and, and that ended up being true. So I think that's an amazing example of the power of economic models, even if they're relatively simple, to take some you know, basic key parts of the world and make quantitative predictions that end up uh, having a lot of truth to them. And I'll show you one of the even more example, amazing examples of this now. So this was um, a paper by Dave Donaldson. And what he tried to explore, as I said, you know, there's not that much gains from the trade across countries. It's significant, 15%. But you might have thought it would be much larger than that. Maybe one reason for that is that already a lot of the gains from trade come within a country, from trade uh, between different parts of the same country, right? And to look at that, um, he wanted to consider how many gains came from just connecting a nation. And how are most nations connected? By roads and railroads, right? And so um, he used the international Eden, Eden and Cordum model of international trade to instead be a model of trade within a given country. And he looked at the most important connective tissue, which was uh, railroads within India. 
So it, a lot, I mean, even today, roads in India are pretty bad, but the railroads provided a huge amount of connection were built by the British. Um, and so he estimated a model of gains from the introduction of railroad. And Anna, did you, did you read the paper by Dave Donaldson? Did anyone here read the paper by Dave Donaldson? Do you want to describe uh, what, the, uh, what the steps were in his analysis? Yeah. 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 The, the trade. So, what's your name again? Sorry. Uh, Roman. R Roman. Roman. Um, yeah. So, what he did is he first took a good salt, which is totally homogeneous, and he said, "Look, the price differences in prices of salt in different regions have to be driven by differences in trade costs, because salt is just so uh, is so homogeneous that there's just no other way to account for the differences in trade costs." That was his assumption. I mean, differences in prices. And so he said, um, let's look at the way in which you would transport salt between different places. Let's ascribe the difference in salt prices in different places to differences in transport costs. And then let's use that as a way to measure you know, how expensive it is to ship in different ways. So if the cheapest way to get salt from one place to the other was a boat, then you would say that the difference between salt prices and that must have been the cost of shipping the certain, the certain amount of pounds of salt. Right? Then he um, measured the comparative advantage, the degree of comparative advantage, by how much, when we put in railroads, which were so much cheaper as measured by the price of salt, the uh, trade increased between those areas. If the trade increases by a lot, that says there's a lot of comparative advantage, right? If the trade increases by a little, that says there's little comparative advantage. So he measured that all throughout the country. Um, and he found the comparative advantage was much larger within India than it was across countries. So that starts to tell us that maybe a large fraction of the gains from trade are actually can be achieved within countries. They don't need to happen across countries. So then he said, how much did railroads increase income? And the way he did that is he looked at all the places that had a railroad connection and he saw how much better they did relative to the places that didn't get railroad. And to make sure that that wasn't endogenous, that they weren't just building railroads in the places that were more productive, he looked at a bunch of cases of railroads that um, were almost built, but, but weren't actually built uh, for like very uh, admi you know, sort of like administrative reasons, like the British ended up not uh, liking this particular place or something like that. And he found that once you, that if you ran that as a control versus this treatment, that there was really no effect of uh, railroads on the development there. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I'm not saying that it's better to do trade inside countries. I'm just saying that, that most countries in the world are big enough so that most of the gains from trade, or at least a large fraction of them, are already exploited within the country and don't need to be exploited across countries. Now, that's not true for every country. You know, Chile is a very small country, et cetera. But, but for most countries in the world, most of the gains from trade already exist within the country and you don't need trade across countries to get them. Well, it's probably more important between small countries than between the big countries. It's sort of what this model. So, uh, Gabriel, did you did you read the Donaldson paper? Okay. So it's sixteen percent increase is what he found. Is the I increase in income that came from the railroads, if you account for it this way, was sixteen percent. And remember, we said that it's only what do we have in the Eden Quarter model? Fifteen percent is all trade across countries. So just the introduction of railroads into India increased welfare in India more than uh, world trade increased world income. That's, pre that's pretty interesting. That's saying that trade within countries may be much more important than trade across countries. Um, yeah. 
Ja. 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 Ja, yeah, so I mean that's what that's what the findings Yeah, so it's, I, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty interesting uh, observation, but the thing that's really astonishing about his paper is that um, there's an, in, under these special assumptions of the edom cordum model, there's a very simple statistic that account, that tells you uh, how much income in an area should go up when trade occurs. And that is what fraction of goods in a given area come from that area versus come from another area. So that should be a sufficient statistic for the gains from trade. So you can actually calibrate the model, you know, as, as we just described, using these salt prices and you know, how much things change when the railroad change for the, and then you can calculate how much the model says an area would be consuming from itself. Not actually, not actually get data on that, but just say what the model would say from that given the trade flows. And he calculated that without any data on the income of the areas. And then he ran a regression of how much income in the areas increased as a result of them having a railroad and ran a regression of that on this quantity calculated by the model. And he found that 99% of the variation in increase in income from railroad was accounted for by what the model would have predicted. So that's pretty amazing that just cal calibrating the simple economic model, not only could you figure out that Greece was in such bad shape, but you could also figure out uh, which areas of India would benefit from the introduction of the railroad. Um, and so I think that that makes a pretty compelling, uh, so here's the regression actually that he ran. So if you just run a regression of the log agricultural income per acre, corrected for rainfall on whether there's a railroad, you've got a 17% increase in income. But if you control for what the model predicts it would be, there's essentially zero effect. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly, so this is net log real agricultural. This is like the total income that the people are getting once they've paid all the costs. Uh, that's pretty amazing. So the Edom Cordum model is sort of one of the great successes of this basic theory of general equilibrium because it, you know, it took one of these simple stories like Ricardian, the Ricardian model. It wrote it down in a pretty intuitive way. It used differences in prices as the model would predict to tell us about transportation costs and the volume of trade to tell us about comparative advantage. And then it was able to make these really powerful predictions. So these basic economic models of trade can actually give really uh, powerful results. They can also be used to design uh, how we set up institutions in our society, and that's what I want to talk about now. So markets can be used to allocate goods, of course, right? One example of that is I don't know um, here at Los Andes how you guys bid to get into courses. Like how do you, how do you get into courses? You have like a waiting list, or how, how does it work? If a course is overfilled, how do, how do you try to get in? But is there like some period where you all like submit what you want as your classes and then some computer assigns it to you or how does it work? Yeah, you get an order number from the other And then you can choose all your courses. I see. And and you get all the courses you want and then the next person goes or something like that, or how does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, the idea that was 
so the, the idea that you might think you want to, what you want to accomplish in this system is you want things to be fair and to be efficient. So fairness means nobody does too much better than anyone else, else or maybe some people do get better classes than other people but only if they have this reason for it. So like if you say, take a set of people who are like basically in the same position, they should all sort of get, get the same ability to get access to courses. That's a natural goal you might want to achieve, right? A second goal, um, and why would you want fairness? Well, we'll come back to that when we talk about redistribution and why fairness might be desirable. But, but that, you know, there's an intuitive notion that fairness might be desirable. Second is you might want efficiency, which is that there's no way to rearrange the courses assigned to people so that everyone is better off. Or that you might, there might be no way to reassign the way in which people get the courses so that everyone gets a better distribution of courses from their perspective, right? That, that's a natural goal. Now, many procedures have been used to try to achieve this. I, I'm not sure I fully understand how it works in, at Los Andes, how you actually do the assignments through the computer system. But one procedure that is commonly used is to have an auction. Um, and um, uh, Gabrielle, did you look at Eric Budish's paper? Can you describe what might be the problem with an auction? So imagine we give everyone a, some money, right? And we're now going to have an auction to bid on courses. What could, what could be problems with that? Eric's paper talked about it, but maybe you could just think of, of what problems might exist with that system. Anyone else want to think, what, what, or look at Eric's paper or, or have thoughts about what would be a problem using an auction? Yeah, so, so you, get, you, get this, you get monopoly money, right? And now we're going to have an auction for each course. And you can like bid on each course and, and see what happens. What could be a problem with that? Do you, do you have any? Yeah. And one course would be like a lot of this, what we want. Yeah. That is the best course. Well, but if that's the case, then still people would have their money left over to go spend on the other courses. And they'd have a little bit left, right? What? I mean, in principle, it, it, it could be. I, I, I think the biggest problem is, so in, in Chicago, what they do is they have a simultaneous sealed bid auction. So there's a bunch of different cor you know, courses being offered, and everyone submits bids for every course they want to get into. And the problem is, imagine you bid just a little bit too low for every single course, which is possible. Now, you should have concentrated your money on a couple courses to make sure you get into those. But imagine you just bid a little bit too low on all your courses. Now, you don't get into any of your courses, and you're left with a bunch of Monopoly money. <laughs> that sucks, right? Now, if, if you had a big open auction where you could see what all the prices were, well, then you could sort of adjust things. But if you just submit all your bids at the same time, that's a really, really bad problem, right? Um, so. The problem is that you know, you, all these markets for all the different courses are too separated. You really should have them all operating at the same time. But that could get pretty complicated for people to participate in. So they didn't, they didn't do that. OK. Uh, I'll talk about a better auction where you do put everything together in, in a few minutes. Another approach, which I think m sounded like what, what you were describing. Sorry, what's your name? Carlos. Carlos. Sounds like what Carlos was describing is, is random serial dictatorship. Um, so is Tatiana here? No. Um, so random serial dictatorship is where we randomly assign some order to people. The first person gets to choose all the courses they want from what's available. Second person then gets to choose all the courses they want. Third person gets to choose all the courses they want. So the good thing about that is that that's always uh, Pareto efficient in a very weak sense, which is that Clearly, the, the first guy is happy about being first, and he would never choose to be any lower down, right? So it's not like you, there are just pure Pareto gains from that system, right? But um, some people get completely screwed. It's like, you know, the, this guy was like, oh, I don't care whether I get this class or that class. Oh, I'll just choose this one. And then the guy down the l l later on the list gets stuck with the other class, even though he would have been like thrilled to get into the first class, right? So it's like totally unfair. And so in some sense, it's very wasteful, because it's like 
people are like not even caring and getting whatever they happen to want, whereas someone later down the list, even if they care a lot, doesn't get it at all. So that seems really unfair. Uh, another system, which seems like it could work a bit better, is called the HBS draft. So this mechanism is one where students rank courses from their favorite to their least favorite, and they're assigned a random order. And the computer runs through, and it randomly assigns uh, an order to students. And every student gets the first course that they want off of their list in that order. But then the thing reverses, and then the person who was last becomes first, and they get their first course in the second round. And then it reverses and goes back through again. So it works a little bit like a draft for uh, you know, sports. It tries to keep it a bit more fair, because it's not like the first person gets all their courses. They only get their first course choice. And then you go back through and you get your second course choice and so forth. Now, the problem with this is that you don't have an incentive to actually tell the system what your true preferences are. And the reason is that you want to list early on courses that you think will sell out early on. Right? It doesn't make sense to list your favorite course first if it's not going to sell out until later. Right? You want to list courses that you think will sell out earlier early. And this can lead to a lot of problems. So it can lead to students getting excluded from their favorite course by bad luck. You could have strategically tried to get into your, the course that you thought would be over demanded, but then that course ends up get, getting sold out. Uh, your, your favorite course ends up getting sold out a little too early, and then you end up not getting into that, and you would have been better off winning your first thing first, but you were trying to game the system too much, and so you get in trouble. So um, Eric Budish and Estelle Cantillon got data from Harvard to try to assess this, and they did a survey to get people to reveal their true preferences, and then they quantified the costs of the problems with the system uh, coming from these types of issues we talked about. But they also showed that random serial dictatorship on the true preferences would have been much worse. So even though there were problems with, from people gaming the system, the problems from people instead just like doing this radically unfair thing was much greater. So even though the system introduced these problems by trying to make it a bit more fair, by not having everyone go directly, it, it got a lot of benefits. So, now, one thing we know about random serial dictatorship is you'd never want to manipulate that system. Whenever your term comes up, you choose your favorite courses, right? For sure. You don't manipulate it in any way. So, and in fact, there's a proof that that's basically the only non-manipulable system that exists. So I think we can learn two lessons from this. One is that mechanisms which are just come up with casually somewhere in the real world are almost certainly going to be manipulable. That is, if you haven't carefully thought through the economic incentives involved, it's very hard to just happen on something that's not manipulable. But on the other hand, economists put so much emphasis on getting things to be non-manipulable that they may end up advocating things that just make absolutely no sense from a common sense perspective because they don't think about the broader perspective of the issues that are relevant. So I think that says that economics can give a lot of guidance to us on certain things, but we also have to, as economists, always keep our minds open to the broader issues and not be so focused on the narrow issues that we lose sense of what are the real trade-offs that exist in designing mechanisms in the real world. Um, okay, so here's the proof that they had um, uh, that there was a lot of cheating on this system. So they um, asked people to truthfully report their preferences in this survey, and then they had people uh, you know, bid in the system, right? And what they found is that um, the, here are the cases where the course was this much oversubscribed. So this is like how many people, how many times the course was oversubscribed versus how often people's demand was lower when they uh, actually went into the system than when they reported their preferences in a survey. And you, you find that almost all of the cases were on very unpopular courses when people reduced their demand uh, relative to what they had said in the survey. On the other hand, when they increased their demand, it was almost always in these very popular courses. Okay, so as an alternative to this, 
Eric Budish proposed making a market with fake money where people could uh, trade. Not an auction, but an actual market. And the way, uh, the reason he did that, obviously, is that markets are very efficient. But he also tr wanted to make it more fair. And the way he could do that is um, by giving people equal incomes. So they go into the market, but they all have the same amount of money. And what that basically means is I can't do very much worse than someone else, because if I, if I was doing worse than them, then I could always choose to buy what they bought, because I have the same amount of money that they have. Right? So two ways of formalizing that is that um, you can do as well as you can in a sort of cake splitting game. So what's cake splitting? It's like, imagine we have some set of goods, and I have to divide them up um, in such a way that you would prefer that I will do the best as I can possibly do after you've chosen the pile of goods that you prefer. Right? This is a game that you often play as kids. It's like, you know, we divide the things up, but then I know that you're going to get to choose, so I'm not going to make them too unfair. Right? And so you can show that in a market you always do as well as if you did play this cake splitting game where everyone was trying to choose the thing that left you the worse off. Right? And second, uh, nobody envies anyone else. That is, that um, I always prefer what I get over what anyone else gets. So intuitively, uh, you know, if things were unfair, I could have bought what you, you bought, right? Un unfortunately, we can't exactly do this. We can't exactly give everyone the same income. Because in this market, because there's only a few courses that you're choosing, income effects can be very large. And what that means is that if everyone has like uh, the same goods that they want, then because these income effects can be large, you can get non-existence of a market equilibrium. So you have to make there be a little bit of randomness in people's income, so not everybody at the exact same price gets this big income effect. Um, and uh, Um, second, the market is not going to clear exactly perfectly. There, if there's a large number of people, it might clear pretty close to perfectly, but it's not going to clear exactly perfectly. And Maria, why from earlier in the class is it the case that the market is not going to clear exactly perfectly? Yeah? Well, think of what we talked about at the very beginning of class today. We talked about cases where the market didn't clear exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And why didn't the market clear exactly? Because there were discrete uh, Yeah, there were discrete goods and there was a small number of people, right? And the problem is that at a school, maybe you have a thousand people or you know, maybe 2,000 people. That's pretty large, so the market should come pretty close to clearing. But these are discrete courses, so the market won't clear perfectly. Right? The more people there are, the more close to clear perfectly the market will clear. Right? But it will always be a little bit imperfect because of the discreteness of goods and the fact that uh, there aren't an infinite number of people. Right? And so, um, so what we get is that there's imperfect clearing. But because there's a fairly large number of people, it's not so bad. OK. So Budish went to the Warden Business School and convinced them to actually implement this system. So what happens? Students submit their preferences to the computer. And the way that they do that is they rank every course from 1 to 100 in terms of the cardinal utility they'd get out of that course. And they allow for pairwise adjustments of value. So they could say, this course is a substitute for this course. So if I get into both of those, the total value is less than the sum. Or if uh, this course is a complement with this course, so if I get into the two of them together, that's an uh, addition. And the computer acts as an idealized price taker. 
So the computer goes in and they run a Walrasian market with the computer and the computer, given the prices, optimizes and the Walrasian market clearing mechanism clears the market, right? And students have, an incentive, have nearly an incentive to tell the truth. Why is that? Well, the only way they can manipulate the system is by trying to exercise market power, right? They try to like change the prices to try to re, you know, depress their demand to try to reduce it. But in a large market with a thousand students, it's pretty hard to do very much of that, right? Um, the downside of the system, though, is it's a bit of a black box to the students, right? It's like I submit these preferences and then there's some weird, wacky market thing that goes on. What the heck is going on? And in fact, this is something that students complained about a lot. Yeah? What? Yeah, but do students even believe that they can't easily? I mean, the, the students might say, this is some crazy thing. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's good. Maybe it's bad. But people feel a sense of illegitimacy in the system because it's happening in this magical way. Um, so uh, then they asked students whether they ha were more happy with the course they got under this system than the courses they got under a different system. Uh, in an experiment that they did. So they tried an experiment with this, experiment with the, something that's like the HBS draft mechanism, and they said whether students were in the end happy. Now, um, the interesting, and they also ran it against the Chicago auction system. The interesting thing is that people like their courses a little bit better on this, under the system, but not so much better. So in the session one, uh, 47% of people preferred what they got into this to the other one. So actually people didn't like it as much there. 70% preferred it in the second one. If you pull the things together, you're getting like a little bit more than half of people are happier under this system than the other one. Not so much though. So I think what we learned from that is that there was, you know, a net gain over these other systems that were imperfect, but we shouldn't exaggerate too much how much sort of an idealized economic thing does versus something that's getting some of the basic intuitions right but might have some small problems with them. So that was kind of an interesting outcome of this. Now, the advantage of the warden system is it's pretty easy for the students to use and put their preferences into. The disadvantage is that it's a bit of a black box and people don't necessarily trust it. They don't really understand what's going on. They're frustrated with it for that reason. Um, and a natural question then is um, how could we allow people, oh sorry, one other problem with it is that remember that people are only allowed to like rank each course from zero to a hundred and then to say, uh, well I don't like this pair of courses together or I do like this pair of courses together. But they're not allowed to say richer things like I want these three courses but only if I don't get this other course. And if I do get this other course, then I want this other set of three courses, right? Um, and the question is, how could we have a market system that would allow people to express richer preferences and be less of a black box? Maybe it would be a little bit harder for people to participate in, but let me talk about rather than having this pretend market where people submit their preferences and then the computer does something, how about actually setting up a real market? Well, how might we do that? Well, we need to have some sort of an auction. But we don't want to have an auction where everyone just submits their bids and then things work themselves out because we know that that can leave people with no courses. We need an auction where everything is going on at the, sort of at the same time, where all the markets are clearing together. How do we do that? Well, um, we need to give people more information. So why not have an open format? So we can announce prices for each course and let people choose what bundle of courses they want at those prices to satisfy their budget. Then we can raise prices if there's excess demand and lower prices if there's excess supply, right? And we can keep doing that until the market clears itself out. Now this is called a tâtonnement process. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that, but it was sort of like what we were talk doing before. Like if there's too much demand in the market, you change the prices until it clears. So a natural question is first of all, does this process ever converge? Um, and second, does it converge in a reasonable amount of time? 
Now, to try to get the market to converge at all or to converge in a reasonable amount of time, um, it, it turns out that the market doesn't necessarily converge at all if the system is not globally stable. That's the things we were talking about. The system might have a, an equilibrium, but it might still not be globally stable. So in general, these Tettelmann processes only converge if the market's globally stable. Another problem uh, is that they might converge very slowly. Income effects are pretty large in this problem that we were talking about with Budish, and so it's not at all obvious that the system needs to be globally stable. So that's a problem. Now, there is a very nice insight from this guy, Steve Smale, who came up with a way to get markets to converge even if they're not globally stable. And the idea behind it is really very simple. So imagine that you just had one market and you wanted it to clear really quickly. What would you do? Well, imagine that you start out and the price is $10. And the, there's an excess demand of $20, right? So you're going to raise the price. You raise the price to 11. Suddenly, there's an excess supply of 100 units. Oh, crap, I really overshot that one, right? Um, so next time when you change the price, you're probably uh, not going to change it all the way back to 10. You're probably going to change it down by a very little bit, right? Because you realize now that this market is really sensitive to swings, right? So alternatively, suppose that instead of having had at a price of 11, an excess supply of 100, you'd instead had an excess demand of 19. So it only fell from 20 to 19. Uh, Nancy, what do you think you would do then? Um, yeah, you'd probably increase the price by a, a lot, right? Right? So here, because you overshot, because it went really quickly, you wanted to change the prices really slowly. On the other hand, here, if the prices are, if the demand is moving really slowly, you want to change the prices quickly, right? I mean, that's, that just makes basic intuitive sense, right? Um, so in that case, you want to speed up the process, right? So what's the moral of that story? You want to change the price over time at a rate, which, or a rate which is positively depends on how much excess demand there is, but negatively depends on the uh, rate at which things change as you start changing the prices. So it's inversely proportional to the slope of the excess demand curve. Right? Now, in this one market, it doesn't really matter how fast you move it, because in the end, things will sort of clear, because there's just one market. When there's many markets, the problem is if, you know, think about these courses, if one course gets out of whack, then that can totally change what's going on with all the other courses, right? And so you need all the markets to clear at exactly the same time. And so if you, intuitively, the reason why a market can fail to clear is because if you're, if one market's clearing too fast, then the other markets get all out of whack. Think about like, um, uh, Rub have any of you guys ever played with a Rubik's Cube? It's these, th it's these puzzles where you sort of have to like move the thing around. And it's not enough to just get one part of it right. Because that can actually be t totally wrong for the rest of it. You need to get it to all sort of come together at the same time. And that's basically the nature of a, when you have multiple markets, right? You need to get them all to clear at the same time. So it becomes super important that you adjust all the speeds so that they all sort of clear at the same time, right? So the more general rule of that is that you allow the vector of prices to change over time in a rate that's proportional to the excess demands, but is inversely proportional to the rate at which all the markets are changing. But it's not just inversely proportional. It, it takes into account the fact that when one market changes, that affects the other markets. So it's the inverse of the gradient of the, of the uh, market demand. So it's this... It's this uh, you know, it's slope of all the demands with respect to all the prices thing that we were talking about earlier. Now, um, Nancy, can you, s do you remember from any of the math classes or anything what this sort of rule is like? 
we're trying to find a solution by going at a rate that's inversely proportional to the slope at a point. Do you remember from calculus how you found solutions to equations? Let me draw a picture and maybe it will we'll, we'll remind you. So, um, imagine that I have, I'm trying to find the zero, the solution to an equation, and it goes, and the curve goes something like that, right? Well, imagine I start here. What do I do? I take the tangent to that thing and I take it down to zero, right? And then I take that point and I go back up. And then I take the tangent to that there and I go down to zero and I go back up. And that's how I find it. Does anyone remember that method? That's called Newton's method, right? So basically this process that I've been describing about, you know, moving around the prices, slowing down if things are moving too quickly, speeding up if they're moving too slowly, that's exactly Newton's method. So this technique that Smale came up with is called Global Newton. Um, and the thing that's amazing about this is that he came up with this from these very abstract mathematical principles, right? But in the end, it's just this incredibly intuitive thing that if you're a market maker and you see that things are moving things out of whack, you sort of adjust the speeds of them to make it so it all comes together uh, gradually. And that is one practical way that you could uh, make the Buddhist thing work in, a real, in real time is you could have people, you could have these markets with prices adjusting and you sort of keep track of how quickly things are moving and you use that to make the market clear. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to skip over talking about matching markets. This is a very elegant paper that I love by a good friend of mine. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over it so we have a little bit more time to talk about the welfare theorems. Why don't we take a five minute break? Oh, yeah. Yeah. that uh, the basketball players uh, market yep. has in the United States. Yep. I don't know if it has something to do with this. I, I know it, 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 it has several rules. It's more like a draft. It's uh, more like a draft. It's more like the draft that we talked about with the HBS thing. So It's more like a draft, like this thing where you go in order and then you go in reverse order and you get these draft picks and, and so forth. So it's more similar to that than it is to an actual market, but it, that's an interesting potential application of this type of thing. Yeah. So. I don't remember how it is, but I think it's an application. Yeah. Let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll come back and talk about the welfare theorems. Yeah.